Lo nas lecho. He, he was still full of life. It's a, it's a remarkable statement. Remember, the, the, they're in the desert. And everything that they aspire to, Eret Zavat Chalav Udvash, a land of milk and honey. These are fluids. The, the, when you're in the desert, that which is moist and al is alive, that's a symbol of life. The man was filled with life. He was filled with vision, and he was filled with life on the last day of his life. On the last day of his life. And the Israelites bewailed Moses in the steps of Moab for 30 days, which is unusual because they've been trying to kill him the whole rest of the time. And suddenly when he dies, they miss him, which is unusual because they've been trying to kill him the whole time. The period of wailing and mourning for Moses came to an end. Even Moses, there's a time when, you know, Shiva's over. And one of the reasons for Shiva, for sitting seven days of Shiva, is because at the end of Shiva, you're done. Which is very counterintuitive if it's somebody you really love. Because you want to mourn forever. You don't ever want to get up from Shiva. You don't want to ever come back to the real world. You don't ever want to finish. Shiva ends, Shloshim ends, life has to begin again. They end the 30 days. Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid hands upon him. And the Israelites heeded him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moshe. And now the Torah leaves a following comment at the very end. And this is a, the subject of some controversy because the question is, in, in, in a very traditional myth story, Moses writes the whole Torah. So the question is, did he write these last words? Right? Never again did there arise in Israel a prophet like Moses. Well, how could Moses have written that, number one? And number two, how would they know? If Moses, you see, the, whom the Lord singled out face to face for the various signs and portents that the Lord sent him to display in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all of his courtiers and the whole country for all the great might and awesome power that Moses displayed before Israel. Chazak, chazak, v'nit chazak. Take the sheet that I gave you. Take a look. Now, what we have here is there is a very, very rich, if you didn't get one, just listen or share with somebody sitting next to you. Okay? Is there anybody sitting and they're not one within two, three people of you? Okay, ready? There's a very rich tradition of Moses' death. That story we just read. What happened on that day? What happened on that day? And what's remarkable about this tradition is you find no other biblical character that has the same set of traditions. Abraham dies, and he just dies. If you look, by the way, Abraham dies in about three verses. It says he reached the age of 148. He, he, he was gathered unto his people, and he was buried by his sons in the cave of Machpelah. Isaac dies, Jacob dies, Joseph dies, King David dies. Very, very brief, you know, for a... When I was in graduate school, the professor made the case that death is the catalyst of religion. That all religion comes to answer the question, what is the meaning of life now, given that we die? What is the meaning of death? Is there afterlife? And I pointed out to him, I, he didn't like this, that if you look at the Bible, you, know, you would have imagined a very long narrative. And he was gathered up to heaven and he lived with the ain't None of it. You have none of that in the Bible. People die. It's just sort of a matter of course. Like, of course he died. I mean, you can live 148 years, but you're going to die. And, and the Bible doesn't take much notice of anybody's death. That's the longest death narrative in the entire Bible. The longest, and notice what happens. It doesn't say anything about an afterlife. What is the afterlife? Joshua takes over and leads the people into Israel. The afterlife is this life. There's no sense of afterlife in the Bible. None. And so, so if death is the catalyst for religion, it certainly doesn't seem like it in the text of the Torah. When you look at the, at the Midrash now, this becomes a big deal, and you'll see why. But there's, I want you to keep in mind that not for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, King David, King Solomon, none of the other biblical characters have this, have a body of Midrash around the day of their death, only Moshe. And look at what it's going to say to us. Look at the very first line. When Moses learned that his hour had come, that was the section we just read, right? He refused to accept it. Now stop for a second. That's remarkable. He refused to accept death. Why did he refuse to accept death? Well, there's several layers to this. On one layer, Moses is every man. Moses represents all of us. And death is the most frightening reality of life, and so he's pushing back against it like all of us would. That's point number one. Number two... 
because Moses is the hero. Remember what we said before, his eyes were not dim and his internal moisture, his, his juices were not dried up. The, the, the great hero, Moshe, belongs to this world. He doesn't belong to another world. He's not interested in another world. This is the most profound statement of the this-worldliness of Judaism, that the guy who wrote the tradition is so committed to this world, he doesn't want to leave it. He's not interested in angels. He's not interested in clouds and harps and sitting on a cloud and, and strumming a harp. He, he did this world. This world is where he belongs. He is the liberator. And the ultimate slavery is death. So he will fight death. And there's one more tone of this, which I think is interesting. This is an anti-Christian polemic. Think about Jesus' last day. Jesus welcomes death because he thinks, according to the Christian myth, that death, the passion and the death, is the drama that it takes to cleanse the world of sin. In other words, in the Christian myth, death is the opening of the door to tikkun olam. Sorry? I don't know if you know this, but they did really well, the Christians. I, 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 <laughs> there are 14 million of us and a billion of them. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a white robe, but if I did, I don't think they'd invite me to Congress. I, it just, uh, I think it's, I, I, that was a very good speech. Did you ever see this speech? If you haven't seen it, go read it. The, the speech that, the, that, that Pope Francis made to Congress was extraordinary. Is he coming, ex now? Is he coming here? I offered him an Aaliyah this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I offered him one on Yontif. I, Skorkin was on TV. Yeah, did you see Rabbi Skorkin, who was our guest here a couple of months ago? He's been on CNN all week. They're talking to him about his friend, the Pope. I, I offer, I just, because I just wanted to be able to say good yontif pontiff, that's all. But uh, it's, an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary statement because there's very few people in the world who have the kind of um, moral authority to speak to the world and to speak the language of morality. Not policy, but morality. He wouldn't do anything either. Didn't he, really? He, he took the night off? Good. That's lovely. So it's, it's worth, but, but, so, but I want you to see how this, the notion that Moshe does not welcome death, that death is not part of the narrative of Moses' liberation of the people, that it gets in the way of the narrative, so he's going to resist it, is a very different story than the Christian story. And I think that what it points to is a different attitude about where reality lives. The Jewish notion that reality is in this world and a Christian notion that reality is in the next world. The Jewish notion that tikkun olam is an overcoming of the shortcomings of this world as opposed to a Christian idea that tikkun olam is an overcoming of death. The notion that Moses has to die, the greatest Jew who ever lived, the greatest human being, in the entire corpus of the tradition's imagination has to die like all the rest of us is the notion that death is unavoidable and unaccept it's, uh, it's unavoidable and unescapable. There is no mechanism by which you live past death. You live, you, you, you not have to die. You, the question is how do you live past death? That's going to be the question of the text here. And we'll see how that works. But it's a very different narrative than the Christian narrative, which begins with the notion that you can overcome death by attaching yourself to Jesus. So it's a very subtle but very powerful anti-Christian polemic or, or response to the Christian polemic. Somebody, a lot of questions. Marsha, yeah. Uh, getting back to, how do we know who wrote that? If he went up to the mountain by himself, like, uh, who, what, is, what is the rabbi, who's the interpretation, how long was that? Well, the, the, there's two traditions. So one tradition is that Joshua wrote those last verses of the Bible. That's the, the sort of formal rabbinic tradition, is that the last six verses Joshua writes. The other tradition is um, that Moses himself wrote it, but he writes it with tears in his eyes because he's writing the story of his own, of his own demise. Okay? That's, that, those are the, that's the way the tradition read it. Okay? Yeah, somebody, yes, please. Yeah, Farzan. That comes a little bit later. You'll see it at the end of the Midrash here. You'll see that it occurs at the end of the Midrash. 
But, but notice that Olam Haba, the, the guys who write this Midrash know Olam Haba. By, by the time of this Midrash, it, it starts during the Persian period um, when the Persians control Eretz Yisrael before Alexander the Great comes, and it flowers during Alexander the Great's and the, the, and the, the, the Maccabean era, two, two centuries before zero, is when the idea of an afterlife becomes part of Judaism. But even if the afterlife is part of Judaism, it doesn't become part of this Midrash. In other words, Moses is not anxious to die in order to enter the next world. On the contrary, he's going to fight back death. So this is, this is the, the, the this worldliness of this tradition is very important. You can feel it in the text. Ready? So he didn't want, when he learned his hour had come, he refused to accept it. He wanted to go on living. This, by the way, is a collection of Midrashim retold by Eli Wiesel. So they're, they're all Midrashim, and you can find the footnotes to them. But he, he writes them so nicely. Though he was old and tired of wandering and fighting and being constantly tormented by this unhappy, flighty people he was leading across the desert. He put on sackcloth, covered himself with ashes, and composed 1,500 prayers. Then he drew a circle around himself, which is another rabbinic image, and declared, I shall not move from here until the decree is revoked. The, the great circle maker is a rabbi named Choni, who brings rain. It's, there's a drought, and he, writes, he, he makes a circle, and he says, Master of the world, you don't bring rain, I don't leave this circle. And it starts to rain terribly, and it floods, and he says, okay, enough, you know. So the circle and the prayers, and he declared, I will move here till the decree is real. And once more his work, his words shook the universe at their very foundation. Heaven and earth in panic consulted one another. What happened? What was happening? Has God decided to put an end to his creation? Then, came, then, then there came to Moses' aid the five books of the law. So the five books of Moses, the Torah, goes and testifies in front of God on behalf of Moshe. They pleaded with God to extend his life because he's the author of the book. Keep him alive. He'll bring Torah into the world, right? But their intervention was unsuccessful. Then the fire joined its, its forces, its efforts to theirs in vain. So first, heaven and earth say to God, don't kill him, you'll destroy the world. And then the Torah says, don't kill him, you'll destroy the Torah. And then fire comes and says, don't kill him, you'll extinguish the light of the world and in vain, and the sacred letters. So each of the elements of creation, all of the elements of creation, one by one, step in front of the throne of God and say, we testify on his behalf, keep him alive. He is the sustaining force of the universe. And even the name of God was turned down by God, right? Now, wh where do these come from? Each of these each of, these, each of these objects, each of these elements is something that was part of Moses' story, remember? Right? The fire is the cloud, the pillar of, of fire that, that, that protected Israel, and the letters of the Torah, and the name of God which he reveals to his people at the burning bush. These are all elements of his story. In other words, his biography steps up and says to God, he's too important to die. He's too important to die. All its interventions prove useless as well. So nothing in the world can forestall Moshe's death. No matter how important he is to the world, he's a man, and a man has to die. It, this is the way of the world. And now, Midrash 2, ready? The following amazing dialogue between God and Moshe, in which the Creator tried to persuade his trusted servant to submit to his laws. So because he and Moshe have always had this dialogue going on, he tries to convince him, right? He says, you must die, Moshe, otherwise people will turn you into an idol. Does that sound familiar? If you don't die, and you don't die in a way that everybody knows you died, then you will not be human, and you will become the god. And you have taught monotheism. So it's necessary for you to die, because the very principle by which you lived your life it's going to be compromised unless you go through with this. Don't you trust me? Asked Moses. Have I not proved my worth? Have I not destroyed the golden calf? God could have replied that he trusted Moses, but not the others. Instead, instead, he chose to make his point by appealing to the prophet's common sense. Moses, who are you? Answer, son of Amram. And who is Amram? Son of Yitzhar. And who is Yitzhar? Son of Kahat. And who is Kahat? Son of Levi. And who is Levi? Son of Yaakov. Son of Isaac. Son of Abraham. 
And he continued to the first man, Adam. Adam said, God, where is Adam? Dead, answered Moshe. So what's God's claim? Whoever you are, you are human. And this is the nature of being human. No one escapes the nature of being human. Right? They're all dead, right? Right? Dead. Adam is dead. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, dead. They're all dead. And the others too, all dead. Yes, says God, your ancestors are dead. And you wish to live forever? <laughs> and the Midrash has a little sense of cleverness. Now Moses discovers new gifts of rhetoric. <laughs> no, no, but that's very interesting. In the face of death, he becomes articulate. It's very interesting. It's this sort of desperation. He discovers the powers to argue with God. Right? Where am I? He discovered Adam, he said. Adam stole. I did not. Abraham. Abraham had two sons, one of whom did not belong to your people. That's equally true of Isaac, but not me. Both of my sons are children of Israel. And at this point, God lost his patience. He says, Moses, you killed an Egyptian. Who ordered you to kill him? Not I. And once again, Moses found an answer. Yes, I killed one single Egyptian. But you, God, you killed many. <laughs> You killed all the firstborns. You want to punish me? <laughs> Still, Moses knew no matter how good his argument, it did not change the situation. The divine will reflects a divine and not a human logic. All right, now stop. So what, do we, what is this paragraph about? Right? One of the stages of, grieve, of grieving is called bargaining. There's a sense of, of negotiating, right? And, and what, is the, what does the Midrash say? Nobody can bargain their way out of the inevitable. And in the end, he, Moses is right, by the way. Moses wins the argument. No death is fair. Every death is accompanied by a sense of unfairness. Every death is accompanied by a sense. Every death is accompanied by a sense of it's before his time. If, the, the greater the person, the more the sense of it's before his time. Because the great contradiction here is it's the great contradiction that was pointed out in that wonderful book by Ernest Becker that became a terrible joke in a Woody Allen movie. Ernest Becker was a wonderful um, social scientist, an anthropologist and a therapist, and he wrote a powerful book called The Denial of Death that Woody Allen made fun of in a movie, but it's a really wonderful book. And basically he says, to be a human being is to live a contradiction. You have something as pristine and powerful and beautiful and elevated as the human soul, the personality, the person of a human being, carried about the world in a container which is ultimately so ordinary and so fragile. The greatness of the soul and the fragility of the container is the contradiction of being a human being. So that when a great person dies, any great, any person we love passes away, we feel this terrible sense of unfairness. How could it be that such a soul with so much to contribute can be taken because such a container was so ordinary and so flimsy and so vulnerable. And that's what you get in this Midrash. You can argue all you want. And you'd win the argument. You're still going to die. Because there's no such thing as a fair, there's, no, there's nothing fair about death. There's nothing fair, there's nothing appropriate about the, the, the greatness of the human soul and the and the ignominy of the and, and the and the, 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 the sort of lowness of, of our of our fate. And even and the notion that even Moses has to face this. Or that rather, of all the biblical characters, the, the, the Midrash is going to take this issue on in the person of Moses. The greatest of all who ever lived can't even win the argument. The greatest who all ever lived can't say, I earn I earn immortality. Really? Not even Moses. Okay, yeah, Pop. I, I bargained with the angel of death. Yeah. He came to me in 203. I bargained him down to an arm and a leg. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, you're right. You're right. Bargaining, you can. <laughs> so I got, I got, I got, I got a, a 10 year option and I got a 10 year uh, guarantee of life with options every year. I appreciate it. <laughs> that's, Pop, that's because you're a very good baker. <laughs> and God likes his challah just right. <laughs> All right, now, one more, one more of these scenes. In desperation, he turns to all of creation for help. This is Moses, right? Heaven and earth pray for me. No, they said we cannot. 
He pleased with the sun, the moon, to pray for him. No, we cannot. Next came the stars, the planets, the mountains, the river. No, they all said, we cannot pray for ourselves. Now, what's this mean? Heaven and earth, the stars and the planets, the moon, this is nature. Nature, nature is indifferent to the, to the human predicament. Nature is indifferent to the human predicament. This is, any of you have ever suffered a loss in your life, the great tragedy is that the next morning the sun comes up bright and early in the morning. And you think it should be dark all day long, and it just isn't. It just isn't. The day starts, and, and the world does its thing. And the stars shine, and the sun shines, and the world goes on because the world is indifferent to the human condition. So the stars and the moon and the planets and the sun, they don't pray for him, right? Please, please. Moses turns to the sea. That, that was a bad move. You'll see why. Intercede in my favor, right? And the sea, cruel and vindictive, reminded him of their first meeting long ago <laughs> when, he, when he was leading a newly liberated people toward challenging adventures. Son of Amram, the sea sneered at Moshe. What is the matter with, what's the matter with you today? You need me? You need me? You talking to me? You who struck me with your stick and made me withdraw in order to let your people pass? And Moses realized how alone and how helpless he was. Nature is indifferent to us. The human condition doesn't concern nature because in nature there's no such thing as death. Because whatever, and nature is circular. This is the great Sukkot problem. Nature is circular, right? Winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall. The, your, the, 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 the organism is born and it grows and it ages and, and it reaches maturity and it ages and it decays and it dies, and out of the death comes the birth of the new. Nature is circular, but circular has no respect for the individual. Only the species goes on living. The individual is erased by time as a circle. The individual is erased by time as a circle. Next week we're going to read Kohelet, and he's going to say everything is futility, because if time is a circle, there's no room on that circle for me. There's only room for the person who takes my place. There's no room for the individual. There's nothing new under the sun. There's no innovation. So nature is indifferent to the human condition. So now Moses is stuck. Who else can he call upon? He can't call upon the powers that, that he invoked during his lifetime. He can't call upon nature, right? So Moses realized how alone and helpless he was, which is a terrible, frightening image, by the way, because this is the great champion. Alone? He's been alone and helpless his whole life, but he's managed to find a way. And ruefully he whispered alone, almost to himself, once upon a time I was king and I gave orders. Now I'm on my knees and the whole world is indifferent. The, the contrast between the man who was once Moshe Rabbeinu, who commanded Pharaoh to let his people go, and now he stands in front of the fate of all men and can't forestall that fate. The, the, the sense of degradation or the downfall. And now, what we know that he doesn't know is that he's going to live, he's going to be immortal. We, but he doesn't know his immortality, right? Whereupon, with a surge of generosity, the illustrious angel of the face, Sarpani Metatron. There's a whole literature of angelology. I know you don't know this stuff because no one ever teaches this to real Jews, right? But, um, but, but there is a whole tradition of angelology in Jewish folklore. Metatron is the great, the great angel who stands at God's side. This is God's sort of prime minister. Okay? And Metatron is exactly what it sounds like. It's a Greek word because it's a Greek idea. It's God's tool. Metatron gives him the friendly advice to stop opposing God's plan. Son, do what he says. I was present when the decision was taken and I heard... I heard them proclaim that the decree was sealed and could not and would not be suspended. Moses should have heeded such knowledgeable and well-meaning advice. He should have left in a gracious and dignified manner, but he did not. He went on refusing to die, pleading, crying for another day, another hour, as would any common mortal. This is pathetic. I mean, you feel the pathos of this, right? And not the prophet of prophet who had imposed his vision on mankind, the teacher of teachers who felt God's fiery breath on his naked face. So great was his despair. Now listen to this. So great was his despair that he declared himself ready to renounce the human condition 
in exchange for a few more days of life. Master of the universe, he implored, let me live like an animal who feeds on grass, who drinks spring water and is content to watch the days come and go. What does that mean? Let me be a beast. If you can't let me live in the world as a man, let me live as a beast. I will accept, I will accept the lowliest life rather than accept death. The lowliest life is better. Let me accept the life of a beast. What is that about? But the beast dies too. Yeah, but not this one. He wants a few more days. I'll give up. I'll give up the glorious death of the prophet. Just let me live as a beast. What? He's abasing himself. It could be that he's abasing himself, for, but in exchange for a few more days of life. He's willing to give up all of his dignity, but all he wants is to hold on to life. That's how important life is to him. That's already, you get a sense of this. Just step back for just a moment and look what's right in front of us, right? The greatest Jew who ever lived, the one who wrote the tradition, the author of it all, is fighting for life and fighting against death because that's how precious life is to this tradition. Please. Uh, what do you think? How you read this, what do you think? I think he's fearful of death. I, I think it's true. I think it's both, actually. I think he's fearful of extinction, of oblivion. But he has God to die in. And, well, he, he, apparently not. Mm -hmm. now, it's, what's, now, what's interesting about that? Tell me what's interesting. The whole Torah is about what? Escape. It's about a people who's afraid to take the next step forward, and he's always the one urging them on. Right? It's, they're the fearful ones, and he's the brave one. And now when he faces his wilderness, he becomes, as, he becomes as fearful as his people. He becomes every bit as fearful as his people. Yeah, Douglas. When is this written? Third century. Second, third century. These were sermons given by rabbis in synagogues. Second, first, second, third century. So they, and collected third century. So 200, 300, 400, it's collected. Somewhere in there. So like, you know, sure, I get you. In the Aeneid, where, where he confronts uh, Achilles and Hades and says, Achilles says it's better to be you know, the lowest of the low on earth than a prince on ha of Hades. Right. They would have had been aware of that tradition at that time? If they're aware of the Aeneid, yes. Let's assume that the folkloric traditions, maybe not the fully, um, maybe not the fully uh, edited, you know, literature of uh, Virgil, but, but they would have been aware of, of like Roman tradition. Absolutely. They, they, they live in Roman Palestine, so they're aware of Roman traditions. Yeah, Sherry. I think there's something profound about the human condition in this story, in that when you are truly fearing of death, and you're at that moment, often in that place of fear, you revert back to a place of your childhood, like mm -hmm. a personality that you never knew. And if you remember, this is when God first meets him, He's in this dialogue of, I don't want to do this, I'm scared, I'm contradicting you. And so it's, it's sort of like showing how human Moses is. Lest you think that he's become something beyond human, he's now reverted back to what, back to what he did, was. Back to what he was, yeah. Right? A scared little man. Scared little man. Right. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah, 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 please. What we know of his sons, in, in everyone, there's, there's the order, and then you gather your sons before you, before you die. Yeah. What about Moses' kids? What? His sons are gone. His sons disappear from the narrative. They're, they're mentioned early in the narrative. They're mentioned again when Jethro brings them to Moses, um, you know, after they've exited. And there, there's only one other mention in the entire Torah uh, of his sons, and, and that's not a very positive one. There's a mention that actually had to be redacted at one point, edited, where there's a mention that one of his sons may have done something not so good uh, later on, may have, may have led the people astray later on. But his sons have no role in the narrative, right? You never hear about this. I mean, da David, you know, Solomon is the son of David, and Isaac and Jacob are the sons of Abraham, but you never hear about the B'nai Moshe becoming, you know, um, important figures in the history of the people. Neil? This story is what we see played out in ICUs on a daily basis. So tell me about that. Where this is Dr. Wenger, my old friend. Real loud. Where a family is willing to let what this person is sap away to simply keep it alive in some very low state. 
perhaps the beast, perhaps not even sentient, perhaps comatose. <clears throat> but it's just to be alive in some other state. That's what we're hoping to do. So Dr. Wenger is pointing out, even though this text was written 2,000 years before modern medicine, 1,800 years before any kind of modern medicine, right? This is the scene that's played out in, in, in ICU hospitals all the time when a family says, just keep him alive. There's no consciousness, there's no personhood, dignity. A million monitors and tubes, and the family refuses to say enough. And they're willing to trade away the humanity for a person. Now, the, the capacity to do understood our motivation to do even if it means e even if it means that, that my loved one is really not the person in front of me anymore give me another hour so it's a very interesting it's a very very it's a very very interesting possibility we're coming to that right? he, he will be at the end because Because, because, this, because his, his offer to God, <coughs> make me a beast, is going to be rejected. God's going to say no. We have the power to do that to people. The Midrash could not have anticipated the capacity of modern medicine to keep a heart beating, to keep lungs breathing, to keep kidneys functioning, to keep a, a human body alive long after the personhood of the person is gone. But we can do that. Here you're going to see that, it, that, that, that God is going to refuse this offer. But the motivation, the, 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 the desire to, to, to see that, that's, that's reflected here. Yeah, Bruce. Is that possible if Moses wants to stay alive to do more good things? Yeah, I, I think he, he wants to do more good things. I think most of all, why does he want to stay alive? Finish the job is one way to put it, Marty. Uh, I, think, I think see the fulfillment of the dream. I want to see the fulfillment. You spent his whole life pursuing the dream. His whole life, every single waking hour, gave up a very, very comfortable life in Midian to go through an awful lot of torment in order to see a dream. And every day, the only thing that has pushed him forward for 40 years of misery is this dream. And he's reiterated the dream every single day to this people who were stalling and difficult. And I think he wants to see the dream. He wants to see the fulfillment of the dream. And he's willing, he's willing to debase himself. He's willing to debase. Now, there's another midrash which I forgot to give you. I think it's later. Is it here? There's, there's a midrash that says, that he says, okay, let Joshua lead the people. I'll be his assistant. And of course, every time there's a problem, who do they go to? Moses, so that doesn't. So he, he's, he's everything that distinguishes him as Moses to see the fulfillment of the dream, and and but that you know that's that's what's pushing him forward. Oh, God. Well, I, I, I got I got lots of people. Yeah. Right. But you see, you, you're you're taking a, a literary character who is distinguished, and you're placing that fear in his mouth. Of course. You're he saying, it's, this is not just a schleppers. I mean, right, and this is the guy who got closest to God. Let's go a little farther. I know you want to, everybody has a lot to say, right? God refuses. Man is not an animal. He must live as a human or not at all. So Moshe says, permit me to stay here as a bird. No, no, I like that. I, friend of the wind. Returning to his nest every night, grateful for the hours it's lived. That's a beautiful prayer. Think about that. Let me just see. Again, God says, no, man must live and die as a man, like all men. God used a striking expression. Now, how does God shut him up finally? Moses, you must die. You have already made too many words. But Moses still not resigned. He fought fiercely to the end until abruptly he appealed to death to come. 
Um, what, what happens is, I get, there's another midrash. I mean, one of the other midrash I forgot to put in. I'm sorry, I forgot. Is where God says, okay, you win. You want to stay alive? You stay alive. But the people doesn't move from here. If you want to change the shape of the world, you can change the shape of the world. But you can't, because if you stay alive, they will worship you, and they will not be my people anymore. They'll be your people. So if that's what you want, I'll give it to you. You can stay alive forever, but the people of Israel doesn't cross the Jordan. And Moses says, okay, kill me. That's how, that's how it ends. When Moses finally agreed to accept the inevitable, he, he begged God not to place him into the hands of the angel of death who frightened him. There's your fear. And God took the promise. Three times did the angel of death move toward Moses, but he was powerless to do anything but look at him from afar. So Moses is more powerful than the angel of death. He can fend off the angel of death. That's why he dies in the Torah, Alpi Adonai, by God's mouth. And you'll see how that works. Moses spent his last hour blessing Israel's tribe. He began blessing them one by one, but time was running out, so he included them all in one blessing. Then escorted by the priest Eliezer and his son Pinchas, followed by his disciple Joshua, he began to climb Mount Nebo. He entered the cloud waiting for him. He took one step forward and turned around to look at the people following him with their gaze. He took another step forward and turned around to look at the men, women, and children who were staying behind. Tears welled up in his eyes so he could not see anymore. And when he reached the top of the mountain, he halted. You have one more minute, God warned him, so as not to deprive him of his right to death. Moses lay down. God says, close your eyes. Moses closed his eyes. God said, fold your arms across your chest. Moses folds his arms across his chest. Then silently, God kissed his lips. Al pi Adonai, they take literally by the mouth of God, by the kiss of God. And the soul of Moses found shelter in God's breath and was swept away into eternity. What happened next? Now we'll find what happened next, but first we'll get some comments. Sally, please. These rabbis, unlike Rabbi Marcus, who was very courageous at our holiday service, spoke with Moses, and Moses Okay. Why, why do you think, by the way, why, why, would, why do you think God made this decree? Well, I mean, it's clear because he doesn't want Moses to be worshipped as a God. Okay, so that's one of the reasons, right. One of the reasons is that, because... That, again, is not a, a very healthy... <coughs> this, this is, I, I want you to understand that you've now taken up a very, very important uh, position in the congregation, okay? Remember Lillian Zaitsev? Yeah. This was my yearly, this was my annual yearly argument with Lillian Zaitsev. So Sally, you have, you are channeling one of the great, talk about immortality. For those of you, Lillian Zaitsev is a member of the congregation for about, about 50 years or so. She was the first pediatrician in the San Fernando Valley. She was the founder of Northridge Hospital. Her name and pictures on the wall, North. she and her husband, Came. She graduated Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in 1923, I think. She was the only woman in her class for like 10 years in, in either direction. And tough lady. Came here with her husband when the San Fernando Valley was nothing but ranches, chicken ranches, and lived in Northridge, opened up a pediatrics practice, um, was a member of this synagogue, driving herself here into her 90s. She drove a large Buick, a boat of a car. You could, not, you could not see her, and she could not see you. <laughs> so if you don't believe in divine providence, we always believed in it. And, and she was, uh, you know, she was a formidable soul. And every year, you know, especially as she got closer to her mortality, she became more and more angry at God on this, on this account. And she would scream at me all the time. You know, where's the justice, and where's the mercy, and what kind of God are you... I mean, she was really... She, you know, so I know why she lived to be 103, because God just didn't want to mess with her. I mean, <laughs> just didn't just didn't need the tsuris, you know. Just didn't need the tsuris, you know. So Sally, you have asked the great Lillian Zaitsev question. So the question is, the question is, you know, and you can answer it on many levels. You can answer it inside the text. So inside the text, God says you sinned and therefore you don't come in. 
And then more than that, you can answer it you know, inside the text and say, well, what kind of man was Moses? And was he the man to take them into the land? Moses is a prophet. And a prophet by nature is an absolutist. He believes that things have to be absolute. If you're living in the wilderness as a nomad, as a nomad you can live the absolutist life. But once you settle in the land and begin to develop a civilization, the leader of a people has to learn how to make compromises. Compromise is nothing Moses knew anything about. I mean, Moses had this nasty habit of destroying his enemies. You have to learn how to make friends with your enemies. You have to learn how to reconcile. And this is not Moses' way. So there's a, you, know, you could make a leadership case, a, a great case for leader, that a different style of leadership is necessary to complete the job. That's a second way to think about it. And a third way to think about it is to rise above the text for a minute and say, we're presented here with a very interesting image. The greatest human being who ever lived has a dream. He doesn't get to see the fulfillment of the dream. The most he gets is the, is the, is the assurance and the confidence that his children will see the fulfillment of the dream. Maybe that's the most any of us can ask for. Because if you, are, if you are able to see the fulfillment of your dream, your dream wasn't big enough. Your dream wasn't big enough. People who dream really big things set things in motion, and the most they get if they really earn God's confidence is the, to stand on Mount Nebo and see the dream fulfilled, but not to actually participate in it. Maybe that's what it is. That's, that's the nature of nature, human mortality. Right? And then on one final level, I have a prayer every year, which is I'm going to, you know, you read the Torah every year, you get to the end. I always dream that one year I'm going to get to the end, it's going to end different. <laughs> I just have this idea. What's, what God is going to say, okay, I'll tell you what. We won't tell anybody who you are. You'll retire in Netanya, right? <laughs> Netanya is this beautiful beach town just north of Tel Aviv, full of old Jews who mutter in languages that nobody speaks. You'll shuffle on the boardwalk every morning, Netanya, with a coffee. You'll play a little chess with the guys, you know. And no one will know. And I, that's, I think that's where he is today. I, I think God led him in the land, and he lives in Netanya playing chess, right? I used to go with my good friend Bernie. Bernie Bedrock used to live there, and we used to go and sit in a cafe. And he, would, he says, you see those two guys playing chess? I say, yeah. He says, you ever hear of the Sobibor concentration camp? I say, yeah, it was the, one of the few concentration camps where there was an inmate uprising. In the, the inmates rose up, they, they blew up the, the, the crematoria of Sobivor. And all but two guys were, were shot by the Nazis escaping. He says, those are the two guys. I said, really? He said, yeah. I don't know if he was telling the truth. <laughs> but I'd like to think that he was. I like to think that Moses is playing chess on the boardwalk. So, but these are, this is, it's a wonderful observation. I want to do one more text, then we're going to get, I'll get the rest of your comments. So I brought you two more texts. This is from the Talmud. So they don't read quite as literarily as Eli Wiesel, but from Talmud to Mura, which is a very obscure Talmud. Rav Yehuda reported the name of Shmuel. Shmuel is a second century rabbi in, in Babylon, in Iraq. 3,000 laws were forgotten during the period of mourning for Moshe. So what happens? Moses dies, and the people spend 30 days mourning. What happened during that mourning time? Right, he had taught them all the laws of, all the, laws of the Torah. 3,000 laws were forgotten immediately. Right, now think, what's the, what's the meaning of that statement? What's the meaning of that statement? Somebody dies. Ever, so, yeah, you've all had this experience. Somebody you love dies. And we sit down together, and we start telling stories. And what happens? Everybody has a different story. No, it didn't happen in 1957. It happened in 1962. No, it wasn't a blue car. It was a red car. No, you weren't with Aunt Stella. You were with Aunt Sophie. No, it, right away, you for, the, something happens when a person dies. It's like an element of human consciousness, a, a perspective on the world, a truth dies. Right away, 3,000 laws are, 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 are lost, right? The people said to Yoshua, to Joshua, ask God. Give us the laws back. Give us the Torah back. God says, Lo I mean, Joshua said, Lo I can't. It's not in heaven. We, we owned it and we lost it. We're going to have to go find it. So the, they're trying to actually work out it. There's a technical question. 
If, God, if Moses brought all the laws of the Bible down from Mount Sinai, why do you need the Talmud to discover them? The answer is because they were all forgotten on the day that Moses died. But this is a deeper thing. Where do you go? You know, you, those, those memories of what happened, of our history, are gone when that person is gone. Every person carries a perspective on the world, and that perspective is gone on the day that they leave us. Right? They said to Shmuel, ask God. And he quotes the Torah, says, Elah Advarim, these are the commandments, implying that since the promulgation of the commandments, no prophet has now the right to introduce anything new. So the only way to get stuff is to read the Torah and try to elicit the laws. Here's the better one. <coughs> Rabbi Yehuda reported the name of Rab. When Moses departed the world, he said to Joshua, ask me concerning any doubts you have. So he said, kid, you're about to take over. You got any questions for me? You got any questions for me? Now, what does the protege always say to the master when the master says, ask me any questions? Always. What does the protege say? He said, my master, have I ever left you one hour and gone elsewhere? Did you not write concerning me in the Torah, his servant Joshua, son of Nun, departed, out of the, departed not out of the tabernacle? Right? The protege always says, I got it covered. I know it all. Don't worry about it. The protege always thinks he knows better than the master. Right? Always. Immediately, the strength of Moses was weakened. Why? Because Joshua says, I don't need you. I don't, I don't have any questions to ask you. I don't need you. And when Moses hears that he's not needed, that Joshua owns the tradition, or at least he thinks he owns the tradition, right? Mo Moses begins to decline. Moses' decline happens the moment people stopped asking him questions. The moment people stop eliciting his wisdom, seeking his guidance, that's when he begins to die. Right? As soon as, as soon as Moses dies, Joshua forgot 300 laws, and there arose in his mind 700 doubts concerning the law. Right? Everything he thought he knew was erased. Then all of Israel rose up to kill him. Right? Because he's not Moses, right? They knew that if they came to Moses, what would they get? Answers. But now that you go to Joshua, what do you get? Well, uh, you know, um, yeah. right? Right. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to Joshua, it's not possible to tell you. Go and occupy their attention in war. Take, the, take them to war, and that will distract them from their, 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 their ending, endless doubts, and, that, and, and, and then you'll, you'll escape their, their, their wrath. Okay? So what happens when a person dies is that is that this, it's not just the person dies, but a, but a perspective on the universe, a quality of wisdom dies with them. A quality of wisdom dies with them. All right, a couple of questions, and then we'll call it a day. Can I ask you to apply this Talmud to your relationship with Rabbi Shalom? Not, not for a moment. <laughs> not for a moment. That's still too close. Ronnie. I agree with Sally and Dr. Zeitz. <coughs> All right, so you can make the case that God was mean not to allow Moses to go into the land, okay? Or you could make the case that God was wise not to allow Moses to go into... What, what would happen if Moses went into the land? Moses, who is a prophet, and a prophet who is an absolutist, and an absolutist who breaches no compromise, who doesn't understand flexibility, who doesn't understand that sometimes you are... You have to deal with a competition among equal goods. This is good and this is good. Or you have to choose between lesser evils. This is evil and that's evil. Prophets are not good at that. Prophets tend to lash out. They tend to lash out when, when situations like that, or they demand the absolute. And, and when, 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 you're, when you're dealing with a real people settling into a real civilization, you have to learn how to make very, very astute compromises and very astute choices. And while prophets are good to tell us that we may have made the wrong choices, or prophets are good to remind us that the choice between the lesser of two evils is still a choice of evil, or the prophet who's very good at telling us not to forget that this year's compromise is not next year's baseline, that we've made compromises. Prophets are good at that, but they're not good at governing because they don't understand that need to compromise, that need to come to compromises and to deal with human weaknesses by, by, by taking by that, that the perfect is the enemy of the best.
or the best is the enemy of the good. That, that if you're always seeking for perfection, you're never going to end up with, with good. You're going to end up by destroying the whole system. So that, in a certain way, Moses couldn't have done what Joshua was going to end up doing. He couldn't have governed this people. And that, that it would have destroyed the people and it would have destroyed Moshe. Right? The, the other thing, Ronnie, is the dream is a dream. What happens when the dream comes to reality? Right? My father taught me how to bake. Right? I'm a pretty good baker. Right? But the difference between the way that he envisions things and the way they come out when I bake them is pretty radical. Right? <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, the difference between the way it looks in my mind and the way it looks in reality. Have any one of us raised the family that we dreamed we would raise? <laughs> Have any one of us experienced the marriage that we dreamed we would experience? Have any one of us ever you know, achieve the success we dreamed we succeed. In some ways, it, it exceeds our dreams, and in some ways, it falls short of our dreams, and you learn if you're mature enough to live with that disparity. But Moshe didn't. Moshe was the idealist. To do what he did, he had to be an absolutist. But to be the leader of the people in the land, you, you can't be an absolutist. He had, to, he, had to, he had to let go. He had to let go. And, and this is ultimately, I mean, I gave a little talk at, at, at Nila. You know, life is about holding on and letting go. And it's a great, it's a great, great compromise. It's a great skill. And it's a great paradox of human life to hold on and to let go at the same time. And even Moses, the greatest among us, has to learn that, that skill. I uh, wish everybody a hug sameach, a very wonderful Sukkot. We'll see each other next Saturday or earlier.